Hello everyone and thank you for coming to our second SET Online webinar. We're really pleased to be able to offer all of our resources um, on SET Online for free thanks to a sponsorship from um, the, the IAS, the International Association for Sedentologists. So um, our community has been growing really rapidly over the last week. We are now up to 444 members, which is an extra 20 or something since the newsletter this morning and 80 more since Friday. So it's, um, it's rapidly increasing and um, we're actually becoming rather global. And our most views on our website today have been from the Philippines, which I think is very exciting. So if you're from the Philippines, hello, welcome to our community. Um, and of course, everybody else. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to this week's, um, this week's speaker, Professor Rachel Wood. So Rachel completed her undergraduate degree in geology with zoology at the University of Bristol, and she went on to complete a PhD at the Open University. She then worked in Berlin as a Royal Society Exchange Fellow before joining the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Cambridge as a researcher. In 2006, Rachel took up a lectureship in carbonate geoscience at the University of Edinburgh, where she established the International Centre for Carbonate and Reservoirs with Harriet Watt University in 2010. She became a Professor of Carbonate Geoscience at Edinburgh in 2012. Today, Rachel will be talking to us about how carbonates are intertwined with one of the most important events for life on Earth, the Cambrian Explosion. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Rachel. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine, and it is a great pleasure to be here. What better to have organised in this these surreal and challenging times in the world, but an international um, scientific webinar. So I am, it's a great privilege to speak to you all today. So this is the, the topic I'm going to talk about. What you see in front of you is the incredible diversity of multi-celled life that we see today, basically animals, metazoans and plants with many, many cells. And this is what dominates uh, life on planet Earth. But many of these forms um, appeared, uh, the animals appeared during the Cambrian explosion about 540 million years ago. But it remains very, very enigmatic to try and understand uh, what actually triggered this incredible explosion of animal life. And this is what I've been working on for the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, the work I'm going to present is very much the work of many uh, people, uh, collaborators and, and PhD students, past and present. And it's very much an, a multidisciplinary problem to tackle this. We need to intertwine information from geology, sedimentology, diagenesis, uh, paleobiology, and also geochemistry. So you see names there of colleagues from all over the world, Russia, Namibia, uh, US who are uh, um, geologists and geochemists and paleontologists and I'm a very firm believer that a lot of really exciting science is to be done at these interdisciplinary boundaries and also science is an international social endeavor. So what triggered the Cambrian explosion? Uh, the image you should see now on your screen is, a, is a, a extreme low tide on the Great Barrier Reef and everything you see there is biomineralized it's uh, corals and this giant clam, Tridacna, that have harvested calcium carbonate from seawater to produce a, a, a carbonate skeleton. And of course, this is the process known as biomineralization. So the big question is why do animals uh, appear and why do they appear with skeletal hard parts? Because in part and part of the Cambrian explosion is not only the appearance of animals, but the appearance of animals with these skeletons. So uh, life co-ops minerals for all sorts of reasons. Um, for example, there in the, in the right-hand corner, you see this beautiful uh, siliceous test of a diatom. So made of silica, but it's this very, very delicate crystal te uh, test. And this is there primarily for um, protection from predation. It's a, an armor. Below we have some cheetahs uh, chasing a tiny little antelope. And of course here they have all those are vertebrates and they have an internal skeleton and this internal skeleton allows the attachment of muscle sites uh, musculature and this allows the exploration of very very active predatory lifestyles and there finally is a photograph of the celebrated trilobite eye uh, each one of those tiny little uh, lenses is a single crystal calcite and here these, these extinct arthropods have used 
where they have co-opted the unique optical properties of calcite to produce this extraordinary stereoscopic vision that we know trilobites have. So uh, there are many functional reasons why animals should biomineralize and produce hard parts. Um, but of all of these, by far the most uh, common uh, um, um, functional attribute is to, uh, protection pr from predation. And also, even though about 60 different bio uh, minerals have been co-opted to date, all sorts of iron minerals and so forth, by far the most common is calcium carbonate. And that's because simply calcium carbonate, as you can see in this Great Barrier Reef, is so common. Modern tropical platforms are, uh, sorry, modern seas are absolutely supersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate, particularly in the tropics. So today, 95% of all modern carbonate production is under biological control. And these are biominerals. They are bioclasts for animals with hard parts. So this is what I'm going to talk about, the origin of animals, what triggered the Cambrian explosion, and also hand in hand with that, the origin of this, the biological control of our carbonate platforms. So if we think about this, just standing back in terms of the, the carbon cycle and where carbon sits today. So you can see here where the sinks in terms of billions of metric tons are on the planet. The atmospheric store of carbon um, is going up at an alarming rate, but it's still very, very low, only uh, 875 billion metric tons last year. It's about the same order of magnitude as carbon sitting in the biosphere. The amount in soil and organic matter is about three times that amount, and the amount in hydrocarbons is about an order of magnitude greater. But all these numbers are absolutely dwarfed by the amount dissolved in the sea. So you see there the ocean CO2 store uh, up to about 40 times 10 to the 3. But look at the amount in the lithospheric store. So this is the amount of carbon sequestered as limestone and dolomite, in other words, sedimentary carbon. It's by far the biggest store on the planet. Now, this is interesting because, it, as you know, there's a relationship between uh, atmospheric CO2, uh, rates of uh, weathering and erosion, bringing carbon into the oceans, and then it's that carbon in the oceans that is harvested to produce carbonate sediment. So anything that controls the size of this lith lithospheric carbon store will have a huge impact on the workings of the carbon cycle. And not only that, whether that store is made of limestone or dolomite, and whether that was originally, for example, that limestone was aragonite, which is metastable, or calcite, which is stable, has a great, uh, has many ramifications because, of course, aragonite will be dissolved easily and will be lost from the record. So knowing the size of this uh, lithospheric carbon store and when it came under biological control and how that biological control uh, affected uh, the evolution of um, the appearance and the proportions, different types of, of polymorphs, that becomes the focus of this talk. So if we go back to about uh, 3.6 billion years ago until about 550 million years ago, this is uh, what you would have seen. It was a world covered in microbial mats and biofilms and then the top there, uh, the top right of course, the celebrated uh, stromatolites of Shark Bay. So in other words, a microbial world without any metazoans. But then at about 570 million years ago, until the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, which is about 541 million years ago, we see all these new curious fossils, many of which we simply have no idea what they are in terms of affinities, but they are probably animals. Some are, poss are possibly animals, like for example, F in the middle there, but other things are almost certainly animals like E and H. And H there is one of the very first skeletal animals that we see in the geological record. So this is now the root of the Cambrian explosion. And there, from about 541 million years ago, we see a real explosion in all these skeletal hard parts. They become more complex, more minerals are used, and we see the appearance of forms that we're very familiar with, uh, trilobites, echinoderms, and other arthropods, for example. So to try and tackle this problem, I'm going to set up some hypotheses. But the general idea is that uh, life innovates, you have these evolutionary innovations, and they perhaps respond to changes in the environment. So this constant dialogue or narrative, if you like, between environmental change producing new opportunities 
And this in turn allows evolution to respond and innovate. So for example, the innovation of skeletal hard parts. Now, if we look at the origin of animals and the Cambrian explosion, so this is just one diagram showing how a lot of the major groups today are related. The, the groups here don't matter, but what I really want to draw your attention to is these vertical uh, blue arrows. And these are the uncertainties. And you can see there's a huge uncertainty on the origin of the animals themselves there, metazoa, and you can see there they are thought, the best guess is they appeared in the Tonian somewhere around eight, uh, 760 million years ago. But you can see the, the blue vertical line shows a huge amount of uncertainty. They could be, appear anywhere between over 800 million and about 650 million years ago. But whatever, whenever metazoans actually appeared, what remains the case is the actual appearance of the fossils, which are the thick blue lines that you see in the Cambrian a little bit into the Egeocaran, this is the actual fossil record. So whenever animals actually appear, there's a huge time lag between when they appeared and when they came to ecological dominance. So this is the problem, what caused this lag? And the hypothesis of choice at the moment is it's oxygen. Oxygen was simply not high enough or not stable enough to allow the rise of complex life. We know that all animals require oxygen. So uh, the, 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 the dominant hypothesis at the moment is that there's a very close relationship between the origin of when animals became dominant during the Cambrian explosion and uh, the rise to some degree or stability of oxygen. So I want to raise this first hypothesis, which is that oxygen controlled the rise of, of animals, of metazoans. So to, to tackle this, we've been going uh, to uh, many, many localities in the world. And before, before I show you that, I just want to show you a, a timeline here. So this is the uh, many of the, the fossils that we find uh, in the uh, Cryogenian and the Ediacara, and the details don't matter. But the problem is, how do we actually tackle what the oxygen requirements of these animals were. We simply can't go back and measure the oxygen in the oceans then. But some uh, recent work, um, very interesting work, was done on the most primitive animals that we have, which are well, probably the sponges. This is done, work done by Dan Mills, and he took this breadcrumb sponge and he forced it to grow under very, very low oxygen conditions. And it was found that this sponge could actually continue to grow between 0.5 and 4% of present atmospheric levels. So this rather put a spanner in the works, suggesting that perhaps different animals have diff with different metabolic needs might actually have different metabolic uh, oxygen demands. And things that are primitive, like a sponge, and they don't move, may be able to survive much, much uh, lower oxygen uh, contents. In the oceans. So this is a, an interesting idea and this led to all sorts of people proposing that maybe our most uh, primitive animals that we see in the fossil record were actually adapted to extremely low oxygen conditions and then during evolution with new complex groups appearing their oxygen demands however were much higher. So really to get this problem of oxygen levels we've got to go to geochemistry. So this figure is what we thought was the summation of all our geochemical knowledge of redox in the oceans through this critical bit of time. And the colours here show that oxygen is blue and um, uh, right through the Cryogenian, Ediacaran into the Cambrian. Uh, so the Cambrian starts there in the, in the green colours. Um, that we think that the levels of oxygen were very low such that only this very surface of the oceans was oxygenated. And then at some point, approximately 560, 570 million years ago, we had oxygen introduced into the deeper waters. And you can see that I've put these cartoons of the three snowball earths. And we think that oxygenation may have started off to that final snowball earth, the Gaskers. So this is what we thought until about um, uh, five, five or so years ago. But is it really true? So I want to zoom in here to this critical bit of time, these 10 million years before the pre-Cambrian-Cambrian boundary. Uh, and you can see this is critical because it's when the very first animals with hard parts appear. And if you like, this is the true root of the Cambrian explosion. 
So if we consider what uh, the paleogeography was like then, 550 million years ago, we had a series of tiny microcontinents straddling the equator. So North China was a separate continent from South China, uh, Siberia and so forth. And I've just put a, a, a red star there on the Kalahari Kratom. This is present day Namibia. And this is an area very, very rich in fossils with spectacular outcrops. This is where we've been, we've been conducting most of our research to try and understand really the relationship between oxygen and the earliest animals um, in this critical bit of time, just before the 10 million years before the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. So we've been going there um, because, as you can see, the, there's hardly a twig. The vegetation is absolutely minimal. And we also have uh, the very first uh, impressions of soft-bodied animals, the first skeletal animals, and also there, the third photograph, these trace fossils of the first animals that started to move over the substrate. The fact that it is, it is a most stunning country and there's abundant, delicious South African wine has nothing to do with it. So here, what we've been trying to do is, there on, on the right are, is a geological map. And you can see the, the critical um, age rock is called the Nama, the Nama group. And the Nama group is fairly well dated. The, the dates there in, in red boxes are the ash bed dates that we have. So the base of the Nama group is about 550 million years old. And the top, it goes up actually beyond the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. But the interesting thing about the Nama group is it's, it's divided into these two basins, a basin in the north, the Zaris Basin, and a basin in the south. So we can compare the dynamics of where oxygen was sitting in these two basins and see if they're connected or they have independent histories. So all the tiny little yellow uh, diamonds there are our sampling localities and they're shown in the, uh, the cartoon cross section on the bottom left hand corner. And we've chosen these localities because they're giving us the shelf to basin transects. So we're starting with very shallow localities going down into the mid ramp over some uh, pinnacle reefs and, and uh, submerged reefs down into the deep parts of the basin. So we can build up shelf to basin transects in both these two basins and of course putting it together through geological time as well to give us an idea of how dynamic redox was through this interval. So you can see here in this field photograph we've been collecting very very high resolution data sets and you can see already there are some fairly dramatic color changes in these rocks, which might suggest that there are also some fairly dramatic uh, redox changes. And as I was putting this talk together, I realized there was a, a heavy metal band called anoxia. It's actually a death metal band from Norway. So there you go. So we're really looking for where, where the anoxic water bodies were and where the oxic water bodies are, and trying to integrate it with the, where the actual the oldest metazoans are found. So these are the two proctors that we're using. I'm not going to say much about them, but firstly, the first one is called iron speciation. It's a very simple proxy. All you have to do is, die, is extract these, uh, the total amount of iron from your rock and also extract what's called the highly reactive iron, which are these four named species, iron carbonate, iron oxide, pyrite, and magnetite. And the ratio of highly reactive iron to total iron tells you if it's below 0.22 that the sediment was deposited in the presence of oxygen. And if it's above 0.38 in an anoxic water body. But the problem with this method is that it doesn't tell you how much of oxygen. It just tells you whether oxygen was present or not. But it could be 1%, 10%, 20%. If you divide the amount of pyrite over highly reactive iron, you can tell whether the... the water was ferruginous there in red, in other words it had a lot of iron in it, or whether it had free sulfur, euxinic, showed in purple. So that we've, we, because this is a fairly sort of on-off uh, proxy, we've been combining it with another proxy called cerium anomalies, and this is the rare earth cerium. And it so happens that cerium, uh, manganese 4 to manganese 3, is uh, reacts at a slightly higher reactive level than all the iron minerals. So it tells you actually, it can, it can give you an indication of where, where these manganous waters were sitting, which are actually low oxygen waters. So combining these two redox proxies, we can, we can say where the anoxic waters were, we can say whether they were ferruginous or euxinic, 
we can say where the well oxygenated waters were and then we can also say where the low oxygen or manganous waters are. So putting this together, this is now a, the combined very large data set. Uh, and the main, main data here to look at is that the data are shown in those little strips of color, blue for oxygen, purple for low oxygen, and black for anoxic. And you can see the dotted line, we've got the data across both basins. There are bits of the record that we can't interrogate because they're coarse clastics, which are not amenable to these proxies. But what you can see there in the cartoon is actually the dynamics of this um, redox through time. And you can see at the base of the Namba group 550 million years ago, we had a very thin veneer of oxygen and a very, very high chemocline. In other words, there's a huge amount of a large body of anoxic waters. And you can see the animals, which are shown there in cartoon form, are just all collected only in the oxygen areas. And then we go up through time, you can see the, uh, in, the chemocline goes down, but then it comes up again, and then it raises again. And then finally, uh, in, the, in the, the penultimate cartoon, you can see the chemocline has, has uh, shoaled downwards into the basin. We have a much thicker layer of, of oxic waters. And finally, uh, just before the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, all those anoxic waters have disappeared. So the first thing this tells us is that the animals themselves, uh, they're all shown there in cartoon form, are only found in the oxic waters. They're not found in these low oxygen manganous waters at all. So this proves, first of all, that these low oxygen waters and of course the anoxic waters absolutely limited the habitable space for these oldest animals. They were clinging on to these little tiny oxygenated oases. Uh, in other words, that the, the oldest animals evolved in these very, very transient, unstable, disconnected environments. And these huge amounts of anoxic water and low, low oxygen water really were restricting where they could live. And then here in this, this next slide, you can see the plan view of what's actually happening in these two basins with the, these uh, anoxic and manganous waters coming and going. But then at about 545 million years ago, so about approximately four or five million years ago before the Cambrian, those waters finally shoal away and we, we see this progressive stabilization of oxygenation at that time. So in other words, this shift just before the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary shows this progressive stabilization. So the big question is, we know that life is restricted or animal life is restricted to these oxic habits, but what, how do they actually change spatially in response to this changing steam, uh, chemocline? So in other words, how did the animals respond? Now there's a lot of data on this figure, don't worry about the detail, I just want to point out the, the plot on the right hand side, H, and all this is showing you is that you've got the soft, soft bodied animals in, in green and the skeletal animals in blue, and you can see that through time, at that junction at around 545, they're starting to move out into the mid ramp and the outer ramp. In other words, they are following the chemocline outwards. As the chemocline, as the anoxic waters shoal away and disappear into the deep basin, life is following it. So in other words, life is following those, that progressive oxygenation of the basin. It's, it's moving from little restricted tiny areas and moving out into the mid to outer ramp area. And the other bit of information I want to point out is in column G. And you can see here, this is just the amount of bedding planes that are covered with trace fossils. And this again is another proxy we have for the behavior of these um, forms through time. And you can see at the beginning of the Nama, a very small percentage, less than 10% is biotubated. And also the, the intensity is very clustered. That's what the vertical, um, part of this means little tiny clusters of biotubation but you can see through time and particularly at the very top there uh, towards the pre-cambrian cambrian boundary much much larger areas of the bedding plane percentage areas are being biotubated in a much more uh, distributed way so in other words life is responding to this progressive stabilization of the oxygen it's becoming more, more widespread and more intense and occupying a much greater area so I think we can go back to this first hypothesis 
and say, yes, oxygen does appear to have controlled the rise of animals, of metazoans. And in this case, we've got evidence for it basically um, following a habitat expansion. As oxygen levels, perhaps in the atmosphere, increased, they, the, we see a progressive stabilization of oxygen in these Ediacaran seas just before the Precambrian-Cambrian boundary. So going back to this figure I showed you before, this, is, this was the state of the art about uh, five years ago, but the next figure simply shows you that things have moved on and we now believe it wasn't just a, sin a single linear oxidation of the oceans after this, this final snowball earth, but in fact there were these several post pulses of oxygenation, they're called OOEs or oceanic oxic events. And we can see there are at least four and there may indeed be many, many more. In other words, this oxygenation is very, very dynamic. It's not just a single oxygenation. So that, this begs the question, uh, what is the relationship of these oxic events to the history of life? So you can see that all these oxic events actually correspond to these negative excursions of the carbon. So we have a very, very dynamic, unstable carbon cycle through this time. And you can see all these oxic pulses seem to be related to these really quite very, very negative uh, carbon isotope excursions, some as negative as minus 12, throughout the Ediacaran and into the, into the Cambrian. So the question is what's really going on here with these very, very uh, dynamic oxic pulses. So this is the second hypothesis, that dynamic redox actually controlled the tempo of the Ediacaran Cambrian explosion. So I just need to introduce you first to a concept. It's relatively simple. And if we take any group of animals, we can divide them into what's called the crown group and the stem group. And the crown group is simply all the things that are living today, plus their last, last common ancestor, which may of course be extinct. And then the stem group is all the forms that predated that, by definition of course, extinct, and by definition more primitive. Now, of course, the last common ancestor is constantly uh, becoming, uh, becoming extinct through time, so that is a, is a movable feast. But nonetheless, this is a very powerful concept to understand the relationship between advanced groups, if you like, the crown groups, and then the more primitive representatives of those lineages, the stem groups. So I want to introduce you to a quantitative study now, this is of a group, it's got this uh, difficult name, Lophotrochozoa, but it's actually a very, very huge group, which represents about a third of all living invertebrates today. So it's the, the brachiopods, the mollusks, the gastropods, the cephalopods, and the bryozoa. So this is what they look like today, but if we went back into the Cambrian, they would look like this. They were slug-like animals. Now, this is a very, very exceptional preserved animal. We don't uh, get this type of preservation very often, but you can see on the back of this animal these little tiny scales and spines, and this is how they're more commonly found if you digest mostly limestone, you see what, what you see these tiny little scales and spines there, they have disaggregated to call what's known as small shelly fossils. So this is what these, all these groups that, that dominate our seas today and produce a huge amount of calcium carbonate skeletal grains, bioclasts, this is what they looked like in the Cambrian. They were very primitive slug-like animals with these tiny little scales, armored scales. So we're going to go from uh, the uh, Kalahari crater in Namibia, which takes us up to the Cambrian, and we're now going to go to Siberia, which was also a subtropical isolated continental platform um, at the beginning of the Cambrian, and there I've, I've highlighted it with the red star. So we've gone to the Siberian platform because the Siberian platform is, is incredibly rich in fossils. About a third of all known Cambrian fossils come from the Siberian platform. So together with my, my colleague from Moscow State University, Andrei Zhravlov, we decided to do a, a quantitative study to try and look at the dynamics of, of these, this huge group that, which now um, encompasses the, the mollusks and the brach brachiopods of the bryozoa, and look at this idea of stem and crown group distribution. So these are what they look like, um, these lophotrochozoan species. We've got 440 through the whole of the Cambrian. 
And uh, this is a rather boring diagram, but just to show you that we've got a very, very high resolution stratigraphic dating regime based on these uh, zones, biozones, but also quite a few ash bed dates. And this enables us to take this uh, approximately 30 million years and divide it into 16 units, which are approximately two, two and a half million years long. So we can bin our data to really quite a high resolution. So here's the, here are the data. So on the left-hand side, you can see, this is just um, take, stepping back a minute, all the total number of, of skeletal species we find on the Siberian platform there, nearly 1,200, shown in blue. And you can see that they um, start in the late Egyptian and they rise and they fall a bit and they rise and then suddenly they plummet and they plummet at this event called the Sinsk event, which is a huge anoxic event. So this is one of these intervening redox events of anoxia rather than oxia. And you can see that the trilobites follow that. Uh, they appear a bit later, they follow that. They're also hit by the Sinsk event. It's a mass extinction event caused by this, um, this anoxia. But the first primitive reef building sponges, which are called Archaeocyas, shown there in green, they take a huge hit and in fact they never recover. They go extinct very, very shortly thereafter. But if we look at B, this is the total number of all these Lophotrochozoan species. So in, in blue you can see the total numbers and again they are also, they reach a peak in stage two, they come down again, then they go up just and, and, and just at the Sinsk event again, they are absolutely decimated. Now what's interesting is we, if we then divide these Lophotrochozoans into the stem groups and the crown groups, you can see they have a totally different trajectory after the Sinsk event. The, uh, the stem groups absolutely plummet, but the crown groups sail through the Sinsk event. In other words, this anoxic event, when we had, we know that we had lots of anoxic uh, low oxygen waters going all over shallow marine carbonate platforms, it seemed to have preferentially removed the stem groups. The stem groups were more susceptible to, to extinction than the crown groups. And this is really rather interesting. So we thought we'd look at this in a little bit more detail. Uh, so first of all, you can see that we have these two phases of the Cambrian explosion before and after the Sinsk event. But Andre and I wondered, you know, these, these just, just counting biodiversity is a very, very crude proxy. Can we get at something that's actually much more interesting, like body size? Now, we know that body size is a very, very good indicator of your success, your ecological success. If you're bigger, you become a better competitor for substrate. You can produce more offspring. It's easier for you to recover from predation and so on. So being, being, having a big body size is always a very good thing. Now the idea that animals get bigger through time in any lineage has been with us for a very, very long time since Cope. And that's a photograph of this eminent um, Victorian geologist, Cope. And he, he established Cope's rule, which is that animals simply will get bigger through time as, as an inevitable ecological process and and it's really just in encapsulates the idea that big fish eat little fish so inevitably things are going to get bigger so cope's rule was really out of fashion for a very long time but it's been resurrected in the last 10 years or so and, and particularly by the stanford group and this is some of their work here on the left this just shows this, the size in terms of biovolume of all these different groups through the whole of the phanerozoic and you can see on the whole, things are slowly getting bigger. So this group concluded that yes, Cope's rule seems to apply on this broad scale. However, it doesn't apply on every scale and it doesn't apply um, uni uh, uniformly through time. So also from the Stanford group, they looked at the biovolume of first of all, um, different single cells, prokaryotes, then eukaryotes, then animals and plants through time. And you can see they show these huge step changes in animals, which I think are the, the, the eukaryotes there are shown in yellow and the animals are shown in blue and the plants are shown in green. They show huge changes very, very rapidly. 
uh, throughout the, the Phanerozoic. And what Jonathan Payne suggested is that this is related to the rise of oxygen. So with the rise of oxygen, so the rise of oxygen is shown as an atmospheric proxy up there in the panel A, animals are, and, and plants and everything, in fact, is responding with increased oxygen by simply getting bigger. However, we also know that when the oceans go anoxic, things get smaller. And this is called the Lilliput effect. And in fact, all sorts of things get smaller with all sorts of types of stress. But the Lilliput effect is particularly well documented at mass extinctions. So you can see here, this is also from the, the Stanford group. This is what happens after the, the end Permian mass extinction. And there are shaded in blue, the uranium isotopes are showing that uh, the, uh, you have a, a huge kick, a rise of anoxia, and you can see in that final panel E that the maximum size of, of gastropods, they suddenly get very, very small at the same time. And remember, this is a log scale, at the, very, at the same time as it coincident with the uh, anoxia, and then they recover later in the Triassic. So Andre and I became rather interested in, in trying to plot this through the early Cambrian. And we met, went back to our old friends. So the Archaeosouth sponges, a group of mollusks, a group of uh, hyaliths, and then these two groups of brachiopods. And we got, we got hold of all the body size data that had been recorded in the literature and, and measured more that we could from outcrops. And we plotted it. So here are the data and they are very surprising. So these are color coded according to these groups. Um, and the scale there, ND is just the very end of the Ediacaran, and then T1, we're using the Siberian scale here, T1 is the beginning of the Precambrian-Cambrian uh, boundary. Now the Siberian dates are slightly different from elsewhere. So, um, actually, sorry, I should say ND is really the beginning of the Cambrian. Let's, let's leave it at that. So ND is the beginning of the Cambrian, and then the, the red vertical line there is the Sinsk event, that mass extinction event. And what you can see immediately is a lot of these groups have very, very dynamic size changes. And you can see particularly T4 to A1, there seems to be a size increase. And then from A1 to A2, things are getting smaller again. And you can see that many groups go extinct at the Sinsk event, but then after the Sinsk event, there's a recovery in body size again. And if we look at this in a bit more detail, first of all, here is the data of these body sizes just in box and whisper plots for these groups. And you can see there the number of species we've looked at. And I've shaded in blue the times when we have the maximum body size. So remarkably, in the first three boxes, the archaeosaur sponges, the mollusks, and the hyaliths, they all show a synchronous size increase between T4 and A1. And then again, they show a size increase just before the Sinsk event, A4 to B1. And then after Sinsk event, you can see they all get very small. The archaeosaurs go virtually extinct. And then there's a little bit of a recovery. But look at the brachiopods. They show a totally different story. They start very big, and then they seem to get smaller. And then they suddenly get much, much larger after the Sinsk event. So they're following an entirely different trajectory. And I've just added now the plot of diversity. So you can see actually what's happening is these body size changes in those first Greek three groups, the sponges, the mollusks, and the hyalis, they're approximately following the waxing and waning of body of biodiversity. But the brachiopods totally different. The diversity is slowly increasing, but it's orthogonal to, to what's going on with the body size. The body, body size is actually decreasing through most of the Cambrian and only increases after the Sinsk event. And then even more remarkably, I've just plotted now on this next uh, panel, I've just plotted the individual species that show any body size change through their range. So I haven't plotted any of the species that remain the same through their range. And you can see here remarkably, Many, several of these species, particularly in the sponges, are actually able to change their body size through time. And they show exactly the same trend. Particularly in the archaeosites where we have about 25 different species all able to increase their body size towards T4A1 and then decrease again. 
And again, these are synchronous in the mollusks and the hyaliths. And again, the brachiopods do something totally different. They decrease, actually, they do show a, a lilliput effect, but then they all, the, these forms that can change their size, take off afterwards. So this tells us several things. First of all, animals can adapt by changing their body size on really very, very short timescales. Secondly, we've got these synchronous changes. I've just shown him this rather lurid pink color. These synchronous changes, uh, one and two, which are, are absolutely shown across these three different groups. But the brachiopods do something totally different. They're only increasing after the synsc. So the only explanation we have for this is that these groups are responding differently because they have physiological differences. And also they have different costs of producing their calcareous skeletons. So the sponge, these archaeosaur sponges, for example, have very, very thick skeletons. And we know from other bits of the geological record that forms that have a very thick skeleton, I would include corals and sponges, are particularly susceptible to anoxia in later Phanerozoic events. So in other words, we're able to tease apart these differential dynamics of the Cambrian explosion. Different groups are responding very, very different ways, different ways. And this is actually what's creating the dynamics of the Cambrian explosion and also the nature of its demise. Different forms are responding in different ways to this Sitsk event, which we know is removing all these, particularly the primitive groups, which is really rather interesting. But of course, the big question is what on earth was causing this? So when we put all our redox data together, we get a very complicated story that we don't really fully understand. But what we do know is that this phase of when all these sponge, mollusk, and hyalis species got bigger, this corresponds to a phase of massive reef expansion on the Siberian platform. It's when carbonate platforms become, became very dominated by metazoan reefs. It doesn't correspond, as far as we can tell, to any climatic temperature changes. The oxygen isotopes suggest that these temperatures were very stable over the whole of the platform. So we can't evoke a climatic global warming phase. However, what you can see here in this figure is in uh, two lines, the, the blue line are carbon isotope curves and the red line are sulfur isotope curves. And what's really interesting is this is one of the very few bits of time where we have coupled carbon and sulfur isotopes. And you can see they're very, very dynamic. We've got uh, the carbon isotopes are showing these phases of positive and negative excursions, positive and negative excursions repeatedly. And the fact that these sulfur isotopes are coupled as well can be interpreted that each one of these is a pulse of oxygenation. So in other words, when the carbon isotope goes positive, it's probably a pulse of oxygenation. This has been modeled by this uh, group in Leeds. This is the He et al. 2019 paper. So they suggest that each of these carbon isotope um, positive excursions is actually a pulse of oxygen in an otherwise anoxic sea, creating more shallow marine available habitat. And the falling limb is actually the deoxygenation phase. So they suggest that there are actually these very, very short term pulses of oxygenation on the platform in Siberia. Uh, the other vertical gray lines there are global redox proxies that suggest there's global rise of anoxia, but they don't seem to impact any of these curves uh, on the Siberian platform. So our best guess is that these body size increases are responding to pulses of oxygen and all pulses of productivity. And I think this is going to be a theme that will emerge for some time to come, uh, as we can really integrate basically geological data, geochemistry, geochemical data and paleobiological data to really understand these dynamics. So I think we've shown that dynamic redox did control the tempo of the Ediacaran explosion, but it's more complicated than that. Physiology is important. Not all groups responded in the same way. So finally, I just want to move on to my, my final third hypothesis, was, which is what controlled the evolution of different mineralogies themselves? 
So here you can see a plot of all the animals that produced uh, skeletons, hard parts in the Cambrian explosion. I've just color coded them according to their mineralogy. We've got red siliceous sponges, we've got low and high magnesium calcite in pale blue, we've got aragonite, and we've got calcium hydroxyapatite, which is often just called phosphate. So we became rather interested in why do different groups acquire different biominerals. So this, this raises the third hypothesis, which might seem very unusual, which is it's controlled by ecology, um, which relates, of course, to what I've been talking about before with physiology and metabolism. So the third hypo hypothesis, ecology increasingly control the distribution of biominerals. So there's a, we can't directly measure the cost and how much it costs to produce a skeleton in, in ancient groups. We can think about it this, uh, this way. We know that producing a skeleton inc incurs a cost and that there are two, two sources of the cost. First of all, the cost from the availability of your building blocks. So it's no surprise that uh, calcium carbonate skeletons are incredibly common today. Think of coral reefs, but it's simply because calcium carbonate is so abundant in today's seas. But if you go to black smokers, you see these uh, scaly footed snails and they have an amazing scales and the surface of their, uh, their shells are actually made of pyrite and gregite. And this is simply because iron and sulfur are so common at black smokers. In other words, life is able to, to use whatever is locally abundant. It has huge flexibility. But the second thing to think about is the actual energetic requirements. And it turns out that the bigger you get, the, the more costly it is to lug your skeleton around. So we have this little cowrie here, and then this, this cowrie has, uh, the species can sh form shells of many, many different sizes, which means you can actually measure the metabolic cost of increasing shell size. And it turns out for a doubling of shell size, it actually incurs a tripling of cost. And also for any of you that have eaten a lobster, you'll know that it's much more difficult to break into the, this claws than it is into the main carapace. And that's simply because the claws are very, very heavily calcified. So we can put this together as a cost benefit analysis. And of course, cost benefit is not, an, not static. First of all, we know that seawater chemistry has changed hugely through time. We've got these alternating aragonite and calcite seas, but also the availability of other ions have cha has changed dramatically. And we also know that the energetic requirements are related to ecology. So if you are, you sit there like a coral all day and you are firmly attached, the cost of producing a skeleton is actually very low. But once you become unattached, it increases slightly. When you start to move, it increases hugely. And when you become a predator or a free swimmer, very, very expensive to lug that heavy skeleton around. So we looked at these two dynamics changing seawater chemistry and changing ecology through the Cambrian explosion. Now, the other thing to remember is during this time, we have this huge increase of predation. And this is a very famous depiction of the Berger shell by John Sibbick showing these incredible predators that we had by the uh, middle Cambrian. I often think that the, the, the mouth of this uh, particular arthropod looks a bit like Trump's. Anyway, you can see all this uh, evidence of predation. We can see the evidence of shell breakage and possible drilling and boring from about 550 million years ago. So we've got a lot of things going on, seawater chemistry changing, uh, the rise of predation, and also thinking about changing ecology. So putting these together, here's um, just in very cartoon form how we think seawater chemistry is changing through this interval. So we have a lot of phosphate in the end of the per, uh, end of the Ediacaran and in the early Cambrian, shown here in purple, and we have also a lot of silica. But this has all gone by the beginning of the um, the end of the early Cambrian. We also know that we have these switching aragonite and calcite seas. So the beginning, the end of the Ediacaran, beginning of the Cambrian, we have aragonite, ooids, and low mag and 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 uh, early sedimentary cements. But then we have a little phase of low magnesium calcite ooids, then back to aragonite, then back to low magnesium calcite. So all this together suggests that the availability of ions, the building blocks,
for life is a very, very dynamic and changeable. So here you can see uh, the, none of these, the names matter here, but you can simply see the mineralogy of everything that produced a skeleton during the Cambrian explosion. And what's interesting is all the, the groups from the very beginning, right up until the beginning of these red lines, everything is every mineral except low magnesium calcite. But the low magnesium calcite only kicks in when the ooids and the sedimentary cements become low magnesium calcite. In other words, there is definitely a, some sort of seawater control between the acquisition of different polymorphs of calcium carbonate and changing seawater chemistry as shown by these independent proxies. So we know there's a relationship there, but it doesn't really help us with explaining why all the other forms are either silica, phosphate, aragonite, or high magnesium calcite. So if I just go now to, from these minerals to the distribution of um, ecologies, now it's going to be difficult to toggle between these, but I'm going to do it slowly. But in effect, you can see that there's a relationship between the two. In other words, it's a matching of different uh, colors of uh, different minerals and different ecologies. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, it turns out that high magnesium calcite skeletons are dominated by forms that are sessile and attached in the low magnesium calcite, in the low, lower Cambrian. And these are basically the reef builders. They have very simple, low cost skeletons. So here we're, we're looking at the fre frequency of genera. We've, we've compiled over three and a half thousand genera. So high magnesium calcite skeletons are dominantly sessile and attached. But if we go to aragonite, totally different. This is the mobile biota and also the forms that are sessile and unattached. And these are basically these mobile primitive uh, mollusks and brachiopods and lophotrochozoans. And we also see the appearance of mother of pearl. This is nacre at this time. And then looking at low magnesium calcite, totally different. This is dominated by the rise of the arthropods, particularly trilobites. And this is interesting because it suggests that we couldn't evolve things like the amazing trilobite eye that uses the optical properties of calcite until calcite seeds had appeared. And then finally, phosphate, so calcium hydroxyapatite. This is absolutely dominated by first sessile attached forms, and these are forms very, very primitive cnidaria, and we think this is related to the, simply the huge abundance of phosphate at the beginning of the Lower Cambrian. But then you can see the green dash line really taking off, and this is the rise of the predators. And it turns out that only, the only forms that use phosphate in the Cambrian are these predatory arthropods and very primitive vertebrates. And it's the same today. Forms that, it's, it's very costly to produce calcium hydroxyapatite. You only produce it because if you have a predatory lifestyle, if you had a skeleton of calcium carbonate, all the ATP and lactic acid you produce would dissolve this calcium carbonate skeleton. So to, even though phosphate is costly, as a mineral to produce, it's associated with these high intense predatory lifestyles. So putting all this together, you can see there's a very, very clear relationship between mineralogy and ecology. Different groups of different ecologies seem to have acquired different mineralogies through the Cambrian explosion. And this points to some sort of molecular templating that we do not at all understand. So just putting all these together, so this is now the plot of changing mineralogy from the Precambrian right through to the beginning of the Ordovician. And if you like, this is really a plot of the changing mineralogy of carbonate platforms through, through this bit of geological time as they came under increasing biological control. And you can see they start off with being um, half aragonite, half high magnesium calcite, but then we see this rise of low magnesium calcite and the rise of phosphate. And then if I just flip to the ecology, you can see there's a very clear relationship between the two. In other words, what's happening is the very first animals to acquire a skeleton were those where it was cheapest to acquire forms that are sessile uh, and not attached. And then we saw the successive appearance of forms of attachment, forms which were mobile, and then finally forms with 
a, a, a predatory lifestyle. In other words, what we see here is the, a classic escalation and the appearance of forms which, with successive metabolic demand. In other words, it's costing these animals more and more to produce their skeletons, but they are producing these skeletons in response to the rise of predation because there's a premium on having protective armor. So I think that we've shown uh, the third hypothesis that ecology is, seems to have controlled the rise of biominerals, but we know very, very little about these underlying molecular processes. So just to conclude, and I know it's been a bit of a, a race through all these different ways of trying to probe the Cambrian explosion, but we're really trying to integrate all these different types of data to, to get at the, the nature of these dynamics. So we know that the earliest animals were not found in low oxygen waters. They were restricted to these tiny little oases, but the, the availability to oxygen was very, very dynamic and seems to have stabilized just before the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. And we see that this unstable redox, this dynamic redox is really determining the comings and goings of the Cambrian explosion is determining stem group, crown group dynamics, and also these, these very um, rapid size changes seem to have been structured by dynamic redox. And then finally, with, when we see the, the biological, increasing biological control of carbonate production, we see that the increasing cost of biomineralization is being acquired in these more demanding metabolisms. In other words, really what we're seeing is increasing levels of biological control through this period as carbonate platforms becoming um, totally under tight biological control. And this is a classic uh, escalation from predation which we see happening later on in the Phanerozoic. So I hope I've just given you a snapshot of, of really how we're trying to approach what is a very, very complicated uh, issue that really does require all sorts of work at these uh, interfaces between different disciplines. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. It's very easy, I think, um, when we just look at the rocks to imagine things as kind of having been one way, but to see how dynamic and rapidly evolving things have been in the past is really fascinating. So thank you so much for your talk. Um, My we're, pleasure. <laughs> we're getting some, some rounds of applause for you in the... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so sure. people are typing any questions that they have for Rachel into the chat. Um, I just want to let you know that if you're watching the recording, um, there will still be questions available for answering, uh, well, we'll still be able to answer your questions um, because Rachel has very kindly agreed to go into the forums to do that. So there is a dedicated thread in the forums for any questions. Um, so I think we've got time for one, one or two questions and then if you don't get your question read out then we've got the forums for that. Okay, so we have a question here from, there are a lot of thank yous Rachel, people have very much enjoyed it. Um, we have a question from Valentin, and he says, um, thank you. I came across a few papers that documented glaciations during the early Cambrian. Do you see any evidence of these in your data set? Or could there be a link between the oxygenation pulses you see documented in glacial or deglaciation episodes during the early Cambrian? Yes, it's, it's rather controversial whether there are these glaciation. If they are, they are, they are local. Um, there's certainly no evidence for any glaciations um, in the Cambrian in the Siberian, on the Siberian platform. We possibly have some very small, limited glaciations in the Nama group, very short-lived deglaciation events. Um, and I think they may well have a short-term redox signature that we can pick up, but I don't think they are, these short-term glaciations are in any way governing these, these dynamics that I've been talking about. They're just very local phenomenon. Okay. Obviously, obviously global earths are major glaciations and they do play a role, but we're, we're talking about the, the much later ones. Cool, thank you. Um, I've just noticed the time um, and we know you have to go. So um, thank you very much for, for answering the question. If anybody has any further questions or thinks of a question later, 
please use our forums. Um, and just before everyone goes, we have a couple of SADS online announcements. Um, tomorrow, the coffee breaks are going fully global. So um, zones one, two and three will all be holding coffee breaks in the next two days, which is super exciting. Been work a lot of people have been working hard to get this sorted and we have some excellent volunteers who are, who are going to be running them. So tomorrow we've got the first zone one coffee break at 10 a.m. Vancouver time. Um, and on Friday, we have our first zone three coffee break at 10 a.m. Beijing time. So um, please like join them, come and have an informal chat. We've been doing the zone two coffee breaks for a few weeks now and they're going really well. So come along and have a chat. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, okay? Um, but thank you again so much to Rachel and thank you to everyone for coming along um, and supporting the, these initiatives. Um, and if you have any ideas for any future webinars, um, please just email us and we'll see what we can do. So thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Rachel. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay safe.